Now it's time to get started, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight again, as we open your word, we partake of what you have for us. I pray you will anoint your word as it goes out. Anoint my mouth to say those things that you would have, and anoint our hearts to receive. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, tonight, um, this probably won't be very long, but um, we're, we're still talking about important events in Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus, when his disciples were moving around, it was still kind of a time when he was trying to uh, retire, uh, one way to put it, from the multitudes. He was spending more time with his disciples, and really most of this is training his disciples. It is things that happened in order to train them for the time when he was going to be uh, leaving. Now, we're, tonight we're going to look at uh, the interpretation of prophecy concerning Elijah. And this is following the transfiguration. So you remember they were up on the mountain. They saw Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. Peter, of course, wanted to build three tabernacles or booths, uh, temporary dwellings, uh, where they, so they could stay there. And, of course, the cloud came down and, and basically said, listen, this is my son, listen to him. So it's not the prophets anymore, it's not Moses anymore, now it's him, listen to him. He's got the answers. And so now we see them after this event, and we start in Matthew 17, 9 to 13. Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. And Mark covers it in Mark 9, 9 to 13. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what is the rising from the dead meant. Then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first, and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written of him. <clears throat> now this portion of scripture uh, is, is, has caused a lot of consternation and a lot of questioning among people as to what is he talking about. You remember when John came, they came and said, Are you Elijah? And he said, No, I'm not Elijah. And Jesus at another occasion said, No, he's not Elijah. Now he's saying he is Elijah. So who is he Elijah or is he not Elijah? You know? So what's going on? Is, Eli is Elijah still going to come before the Messiah comes back or not? Did he already come? And this scripture uh, is one of the foundations for some people who have historical uh, perspective on Revelation. They say that Elijah already came, the Messiah already came, so he, the, the book of Revelation has already been done. And they point to certain people and, you know, and they try to put the book of Revelation as if it was history. Well, that would be interesting if the Messiah was currently ruling for a thousand years, or if the sun and moon had turned away and we had a new heaven and a new earth. Yeah, I might, might be able to get that, but I don't see in the history books where either of those events have ever happened. So uh, there has to be a problem with how we are interpreting Scripture. There's nothing wrong with Scripture. It's how we interpret it. So <clears throat> here they are coming off of the mountain. Jesus turns to them. 
And he says, I don't want you to tell anybody what you've seen until the Son of Man has risen from the dead, or until I rise from the dead. Now, this caused some problems for the disciples. Uh, since he had to die, the transfiguration, along with the miracles he performed, would prove he was divine. Okay? So, here to the disciples is proof positive that God is divine, or that Jesus is divine. And here is Jesus saying, uh, well, don't tell anybody until, <laughs> until I rise from the dead. If he's divine, how could he die? I mean, you, you put yourself in their position. Jesus has done all of these things. He's been training them and showing them that he's not a prophet, that he is, in fact, the Son of God, that he is divine. He's gone to all, he walked on the sea. He did all of these things, and now he says, oh, by the way, I'm going to die. What? You can see how they were perplexed. You can see how this did not make sense to them. They, 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 they caught the idea, I'm sure, of him rising from the dead. That wasn't the issue. The issue was, how could he die in the first place? He's God. And remember, they were looking for a Messiah that would come on the scene right then. So they, here's Jesus saying, yeah, I am the Son of God. And they recognized that as saying, I am the Messiah. So they, what they were anticipating was at some point, Jesus would suddenly stand up and take the throne and lead them into a whole new age, uh, the golden age of Israel, or it would be platinum age, I guess, or something beyond that, you know, where they, where they would rule them all. They were looking forward to this. And then he says, but I'm going to die. And then I'm going to raise from the dead. <clears throat> well, that didn't make sense to them. Uh, and here was what was really bothering them. They understood from scriptures and from their teaching, from the scribes, and you know, these were, these were devout Jews. I mean, they had been to the temple. They had been listening to all of the teaching. They understood that before the Messiah would come, Elijah the Tishbite would come, the prophet Elijah. Remember, he was taken up in a chariot of fire. He never died. And so, <clears throat> according to Jew, the Jewish teachings, he would come back before the Messiah. And so, he, they've got all of these questions, so they ask Jesus, if you're going to die from the dead, I'm paraphrasing, if you're going to die and be raised from the dead, why then are the scribes saying that Elijah is going to come before you come? Because here you are, and I haven't seen Elijah. I haven't seen Elijah the Tishbite. Hmm. So what was the problem? Was Elijah coming or wasn't he? Um, and then Jesus' answer made it even worse. He said, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. And I can see the disciples looking around saying, I don't see anything restored. We're still under Rome. We're still, you know, nothing has been changed. Haven't seen Elijah, haven't seen a whirlwind, haven't seen the rain stopped, haven't seen any of the miracles of Elijah. I haven't seen Elijah, and then we're not changed. So, wait a minute, Lord, what's going on here? But Jesus went on to say that Elijah has come. Now, wait a minute. Elijah will come, but Elijah has come. Now, has he come or will he come? Paradox. What do we do? Is he as he or will he? He says he's come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatsoever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hands. They understood he was talking about John the Baptist, but he already said that John the Baptist was not Elijah, and yet here he's saying that John the Baptist was Elijah. What a, what a, what a mess, you know? When you just try to look at this and understand what Jesus was talking about. 
But let's turn to Malachi, the book of Malachi. Because this little book, the last chapter of the book of Malachi, chapter 4, is an interesting book, uh, interesting chapter, because it really sums up uh, what, what Jesus was talking about. In verse 5, he says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And this is God speaking. So he is, in fact, going to come, and this is Elijah the Tishbite. This is the guy that went up in the chariot and never died. He's coming back, and we find that in Revelation. But he is one of the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. The other one has to be Enoch, because there's only two men that have never died, Enoch and Elijah. And the Bible says every man is appointed to die once, therefore they're going to have to die whether they like it or not. Uh, you know. And you can argue about Moses. Moses died already, so if he's already dead, to raise him up from the dead so he could die again would be a greater miracle than Jesus rising from the dead because he only stayed in, in, in the grave three days. Lazarus was four. Look at... Elijah, he'd been in the grave thousands of years. So that doesn't hold water. You know, that doesn't really make sense that he would raise Elijah from the dead. Or, or I mean Moses from the dead. Moses, not Elijah. Raise Moses from the dead so he could be one of the two witnesses and die again. And that doesn't, that doesn't get it. So it's going to be Enoch and Elijah. And they are going to come. And they have a specific uh, duty that they're going to do. And we're going to look at that. Uh, in a little bit here. But G just as Jesus first came as the suffering Messiah to be the Savior of the world, so John the Baptist came as the forerunner of the Savior to make straight the paths in Isaiah 41 to 5. This is what it says. It says, Isaiah came, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says our God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Now at first you might look at that and say, wow, you know, we're talking here about blessings on Israel. But really what it says, it says that her warfare is ended, her iniquity is pardoned. But, but she's received double for her sins, not double blessings. She's not a nation anymore. Israel can't go to war. She has no nation. This, you know, this is what he's talking about here. It's not going to have a, a nation. But notice this. In the middle of this, it says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness. All of a sudden, we jump from Israel uh, getting double for her sins to suddenly here's a man who comes, or a voice, crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every mount, every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked place shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, we read that, and we assume he's talking about the end days. But according to John the Baptist, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John said that. I am the one. I am the voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the ways of the Lord. I want you to notice some things here. Everything that this Elijah is supposed to do, he, it, it pertains to to making a level place for the king to come through. I know we've talked about it before, but in those days, whenever the king moved, if he took his army to go someplace, or he was going somewhere, there was a whole bunch of engineers that went in front of him. And if there was a hole, they filled it in. If there was a mountain, they took it down. Everything was smooth. He never had to go up a hill or down a hill unless it was a mountain so big they couldn't move it. Otherwise, every hill was made flat, every low place was filled in, 
and he had a highway that was flat and smooth so he could just go straight through. That's what he's talking about here. And we saw in John the Baptist that this is exactly what he did. Not in the sense of moving mount, actual mountains and valleys, but in the sense that he prepared the way of the Lord by preparing the hearts of Israel to receive. He preached to thousands. He baptized thousands. We know because the multitude started following Jesus, and it says they were the disciples of John. They'd been following John. So when Jesus came on the scene and started ministering, John had already set the stage. He'd already prepared the hearts. He'd already been talking about repentance. He'd already been taking the things of the, of the law, the rituals, the baptism that had applied to the leper and so forth, and he now applied it to the heart. Remember, that's what got the Pharisees coming after him, asking him what he was doing. Who gave him the authority to baptize or to go to the huskva and have people dip to get rid of their sins? Where did this come from? That's not in the law. He was doing that because he was making straight the way of the Lord. Now, I want you to look at Elijah the Tishbite, who will come. Now, this is... Uh, <clears throat> This is, is from Malachi 4, 5 to 6. He's one of the two witnesses, but notice what he does. Malachi 4, 5 and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet, specifically Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now this specifies it's the great and, dread, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Not, not Jesus' self savior, but, but Jesus king. Jesus bringing punishment. Jesus bringing, uh, you know, the things we see in Revelation where he comes and defeats Antichrist and he's walking around with blood dripping off of his vesture. This is what is the great and dreadful day of the Lord. For the world, this is a dreadful time. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And that's how the book ends. You see, there were two different reasons for the first and the second Elijah to come. The first Elijah was a spiritual Elijah, just as the first Messiah was a spiritual Messiah. The second Elijah is a natural Elijah or physical Elijah, just as the second Messiah is a physical or natural Messiah. The first one did not come to reign on the earth. He came to die so that he could reign in the hearts of men. The second one comes not so he can reign in the hearts of men, but so that he could reign in the natural world over Israel. So you have a natural Messiah, a natural Elijah, a spiritual Messiah, a spiritual Elijah. That's why Elijah came already, but he's still going to come. It was the spirit of Elijah, not Elijah. Okay. So that was what he was talking about, but it caused so much difficulty with people to try to understand that. It was hard. As we find, the disciples never did get it figured out until the very end. Even after Jesus had died, they still didn't quite get it figured out. It wasn't until he rose again. And we also have to remember, we don't think about it, but Jesus didn't rise from, the, rise from the dead, walk around a couple of days, and then be translated. He was here for many weeks and perhaps months before he actually was translated. So there was that time of training with his disciples after he had risen from the dead. So they got firsthand, uh, you know, not only the words, but they saw it, and they saw the difference. All right, <clears throat> so he's come down from the mountain with his disciples. 
Um, and so uh, they have asked him this probably on the road down the mountain. Now remember, there was only three up there with him. There wasn't 12 disciples with him. There was only the three. So they weren't even to tell the other nine what went on. They were to keep it to themselves. So when we get to the part later on, you know, where Jesus raises from the dead and you've got Thomas who doubts. See, Thomas wasn't up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't see Jesus in all of his glory. You don't see Peter, James, or John, any one of the three, doubting that part of it. Now we saw Peter turns his back, you know, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to die, you know. But we don't see where he ever doubted that. He doubted whether God would accept him back. But he never doubted after that the deity of Christ. All right, so they come down, now they're moving into town. And uh, we pick up Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 to 21. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, If you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now I'll read Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 29. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whatever, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouse, mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, 
deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him, and he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, This kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Then we read Luke chapter 9, verses 37 to 43. And it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implore your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithful, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And he was coming, and as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. All right, we see here a, a very vivid story in, in a portrayal of what was going on. Now we know that Jesus went up on the mountain and was probably up there at night. We saw the transfiguration. So here we are the next day. So it's been a day since he's been gone. And <clears throat> he's coming down the mountain. The disciples ask him, you know, about Elijah. But notice it says in, in uh, Mark's rendering, he came down to the disciples. So he had Peter, James, and John with him. And he came down to the other nine disciples. And when he got down there, he found them. And uh, around them were the, were the scribes, and they were disputing, they were arguing with his disciples. And so Jesus, of course, he was, the, he was the rabbi, he was the teacher of, this, of these disciples. They were his disciples. And so he had every right to get into the conversation and ask the scribes, what is it that you're discussing? What are you disputing about? And they didn't answer, but notice that the man in the crowd did. He called out and he said, uh, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. In other words, what they're arguing about is I brought a bo my boy who has a mute spirit. And when you boil everything off, what happened, and I'm just going to paraphrase it, he came down and the scribes were there, and he, there was Jesus' disciples, and so he brought the boy, his only child, to the disciples. He was deaf and dumb, and he suffered from what we would call epilepsy. And, and he said, I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And so in jumped the scribes. Wow. And you, you know, you, we don't know what they were saying exactly, but you, you can figure it out because we knew who the scribes were. We know they were after Jesus at this point. So you can see them, say, you can see them sitting there saying, well, you know, yeah, you can do a few easy things, but it's probably the devil that's doing it. But when he gets to something really hard, you, you don't have the power and neither does he. You know, you can see this discussion going on, this debate, this clanging of heads. And, of course, anytime you get a dispute, you're going to get a big multitude. So here's this big multitude out there. He said, I brought him. And every time it seizes him, it throws him down. And this demon tries to throw him in the fire, tries to throw him in the water. He gets rigid and he foams at the mouth and he screams and, and, and then he gets all bruised. And, you know, you can... 
Now, uh, for a few years, I, I, I worked in the handicapped workshop business here in Washington and uh, worked at one particular place, and we had a lot of epileptic men. It was, happens to be a, a blind and uh, blind workshop up in Seattle, the biggest one up there. And I was doing industrial engineering, and I was a manager over a couple of departments. And, but, but, you know, there was one guy in particular would have these epileptic seizures. And he worked in the, down in a, like a shipping department. And man, when he had those things, racks would go over. I mean, he hit the floor, and we'd have to jump on him, hold him down. Not, not that we were, you know, trying to protect him from, but, but we didn't want him to get hurt, you know. And we were trying to protect him from flailing around and knocking himself and hurting himself. Uh, holding him didn't do any good as far as the epilepsy was concerned. But it kept him safe, you know. Now, if he was out in the middle of the floor, we'd let him go, and he'd roll all over the floor and foam at the mouth and scream and holler and carry on and, uh, you know, these grand mall seizures. And, uh, you know, there were some pretty good-sized boys, and it took all we could do to keep him down so he wouldn't get hurt. And then when he'd get done, sometimes he'd just lay there, and you'd think for sure he was dead or the doornail. Pretty soon he'd move around and get up, and, We'd have to help him. It'd be maybe an hour before he could get up and stand up again. It would just wear him out that much, the strain of that. And, and, and I, so I, I can relate to what he's saying here. And this probably was not a little boy. This was probably a man. Because when Jesus asked him, how long has this been going on? He said, since his childhood. So he was probably a man. This had been going on for years and years and years. This demon was so firmly entrenched in this boy. And he says they couldn't cast him out. Now, if we're not careful, we get the impression that Jesus was rebuking his disciples. In fact, I run one, one of the commentaries I was looking at. They said, well, Jesus got on his disciples. No, he said, Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. He didn't say faithless disciples. He said faithless and perverse generation. What was the problem? It was the generation. It was the perverseness of that generation. It had set things in such an array that, that the disciples were not strong enough to be able to overcome the unbelief, the skepticism, all of the stuff that these scribes, these leaders, were bringing in. He says, how long am I going to tarry with you people? How long am I going to be around here having to put up with you? Bring him to me. And so they brought the boy. And as they were bringing this boy, notice what happened. He was thrown down. He began to foam at the mouth. Why did he do that? It says, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. When God looks at a spirit, he's got to do something. Now, you remember the spirits that were in the demoniacs in the tomb. And we think about how powerful these guys were. I mean, he was breaking chains and everything else. You know, he was just a powerful thing. And when Jesus touched foot on the shore, here he came. And the first thing he said, why are you here to tempt us? Can, can we go jump in these sheep? I mean, in these pigs and get out of here, you know? And there was a hundred of them, it says a legion, and there was, well, a legion, there was probably thousands of them. And they all got out and jumped in these sheep, and the sheep went off and all died. But notice this demon. When Jesus looked at him and saw him, he immediately convulsed the boy. This was not an ordinary demon. This was not an ordinary possession. This was something extraordinary. This was an extraordinary strong demon. You know, we, we tend to think that demons are demons. You see one, you see them all. That's not the case. Some are much stronger than others. That's why the Apostle Paul, he said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Different ranks, different strengths, different types. Hmm. So notice what Jesus says. Now, <clears throat> I'm convinced Jesus could have just Knock it off, and that would have been the end of that. Cast him out right there. But he didn't do that. 
He looked at the man. And look what the man says. But if you can do anything, have compassion. <laughs> now we look at that and say, well, this man was asking Jesus, do you have enough power to deal with this demon? But I don't think that was what the question was. The question was, can you do anything in this kind of an atmosphere? Can you do anything with a wicked and perverse generation around you? You see the difference? He wasn't questioning the power of Jesus. He was questioning whether Jesus would use the power or not. You'll remember, and Pastor mentioned it Sunday, when he was in Nazareth, he didn't do very many miracles. Why? Because of their unbelief. Not that he couldn't, he wouldn't. That tells us something. We sometimes limit the power of God because we look at him and say, I don't know if God can do this. I don't know if God can do this. This is more than maybe he can handle. The question isn't, will, can God do it? It's the question of, will God do it? When we take it away from can and put it on will, what we do is we take the question away from God and we put it on us. Will he do it for us? That puts us in the position of having to be in a place that will generate Something that causes God to do a miracle for us. Whatever that miracle is. And Jesus backs that up. <clears throat> Notice what he says to them. Um, Jesus, when he threw him down, asked how long you've been that way. Since he was a little boy, he says, can you do anything? If he could, ask Jesus if he could to have compassion on him. If you can have compassion on me, have it. And on his son to help them. Jesus told the man that if he believed, All things were possible. Now, he didn't ask him. <clears throat> he said, if you can believe. You're saying, if I can do anything, if I can have compassion and heal, I'm saying, if you can believe. In other words, if you can believe, I can have compassion. In order to move God, it takes more than just making a statement. It takes a proclamation that comes from the heart. Notice this man. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believes. Immediately. The father didn't have to go and say, just a minute, let me go think about this. Let me go talk to the scribes. Let me go see a rabbi. Let me get the Torah out and see what it says. It says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears. I believe. You see, his statement was not just a statement. Today, we make a big mistake within Christianity in general. And I'm getting more and more to the point where I don't like the sinner's prayer. I'm getting to the point where I really don't like it. And the reason I don't like it is because it's just words. Repeat after me. 
Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I'm going to do better. Save me. It doesn't come from the heart. There's nothing in there that says, I am making a real proclamation that starts down here. And people walk out the door, oh, I said the sinner's prayer, I'm saved. I believe, yes, I do. Do they really? And there is a biblical text. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they don't have the signs, are they believing? Whoa. We wonder why we don't have mountains moved. Hmm. What did Jesus tell his disciples? He said, if you have the faith as a grain of mustard seed, if you can believe just that much, you can move that mountain. Hmm. You ever had a mountain move? <laughs> yeah. How much do we really have? Do we really believe? He didn't have to hesitate. He didn't have to go look and read something or build up something. He said, I believe. And in case my belief isn't enough, help my unbelief. You see, it was more than just a statement. It was a proclamation that came from the heart that was backed up by something that said, if my belief is not enough, then help my unbelief. We're busy all the time praying, God, give me more faith. God, help my faith. It's not the faith, it's the problem, it's the unbelief. We need to have the unbelief dealt with, and the belief will take care of itself. Now, I want you to notice verse 25 of, of Mark. Here's Jesus with the man. He was evidently over to the side. We saw that before where he took a man over to the side. Because he looked up and he saw the multitude running to come over and see what he was going to do. You see, the problem, this was the wicked, this was the perverse generation that was coming, that was faithless. A faithless and perverse generation. And here they come running towards Jesus as he's about to cast out this powerful demon. I can see Jesus looking up, seeing this faithless generation come to him. And it says, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit. He did not need to fight the unbelief of the multitude in order to conquer and dive out the Spirit. Notice what happened. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to them, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Notice what the Spirit did. He didn't just quietly come out. He didn't say, hey, is it okay if I go over there? Can I go over here? No. It said the spirit cried out and convulsed the boy greatly. He was stubborn. He'd been entrenched in there for years. He was powerful. The reason the disciples couldn't cast him out, they didn't have enough power to cast him out. This was not before the day, this was before the day of Pentecost. They didn't have that power ingrained in them to deal with this kind of a spirit. So he convulsed him. Here's the boy on the ground again. He's convulsing. He's tightening up. He's foaming. He's screaming. He's rolling. He's banging into things. He's just going nuts on the ground. And suddenly the demon came out. And there he was, dead. As far as they were concerned, he looked dead. Some of them said, oh, he's dead. Notice Jesus didn't say anything. He just walked over and took the boy by the hand and stood him up. 
You see, there's nothing more powerful than Jesus. Nothing more powerful than Jesus. I don't care how big the demon is. I don't care how many are in there. I don't care how long they've been in there. I don't care who it is. I don't care what it is. There's nothing more powerful than Jesus. What the problem is, is we need to get ourselves aligned with his power. If we could just tap into a small percentage of the power of Jesus by having belief and not unbelief, what could we do? We look around and say, well, I've been trying. I've done everything. It's like that little widow woman with the issue of blood. She tried everything. Now she could have stayed home. Said, I've tried everything. There ain't no use. But she just wanted to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Just touch that fringe that hangs down. If I can just touch that, I know. I know if I can just touch it. I believe if I can just touch it. And it wasn't a statement. It was backed up with a proclamation that came from the heart to the point that she was willing to sacrifice everything and the possibility of being stoned to death right there on the ground to reach out and touch him. Instantly healed. This boy, instantly healed. You see, there's so many things in Scripture. There's Brian Bartimaeus. We haven't covered him yet. But he's screaming out, and the disciples even are trying to tell him to quiet down. He's not going to quiet down. He's saying, Jesus, have mercy on me. You can heal me if you'll just show mercy. you got the power to show the mercy. And it was his faith. It was his reaching out. It was his determination that came from the heart that attracted Jesus. And he went over and healed him. You see it? It's how we approach God. We say, why did it, why was it on the east side of the lake that wherever he walked, they just laid people out in the walkways and, and, and he just walked by. They just said, would you walk over here? And he'd walk out and they'd touch his garment and were healed. Because they didn't have any theological problems with Jesus being able to heal them. But when he went to the west side, over in Israel, here were the scribes. And they had their theological ideas. And they had their religious ideas. And he couldn't heal over there. He couldn't have the miracles over there. Because he wasn't powerful enough? No. Because they didn't have enough faith to turn on compassion. Hmm. Wow. Jesus raised that boy up and presented him to the Father completely healed. Notice this. After they went into the house, disciples, nine, the nine of them came to him. He said, why is it that we couldn't cast out that demon. And he said it's because this kind only comes out through prayer and fasting. There are things we cannot do on our own. We must have the power of God behind it. It takes prayer. It takes fasting. Now, I've mentioned my ideas on fasting before. Fasting is not just something you do. The Pharisees did that. Jesus rebuked them for it. It's not just doing it. You do it for a purpose. You do it for a reason. If you need, if you need your unbelief taken care of, then fasting and prayer is what brings about the cleaning up of unbelief. 
reading the scriptures, seeing what, you know, building your faith, that's all good. You've got to do that. But it's through the prayer and fasting that takes care of the unbelief. When we get our eyes off of what everybody else thinks and we get them centered on Jesus, then everything becomes possible. When we start looking around us, everything becomes impossible. The mountain becomes impossible when we look at it through our eyes. When we look at it through Jesus' eyes, it's absolutely possible. Sure, we can throw that mountain out of the way. See? Prayer and fasting. Um, before I move on, I wanted to uh, do a little quick thing here and kind of catch us up to date to where we are before we take this last little section here. We've been looking at this tour of Caesarea Philippi, and in this we had, during this time, which was the last of the winter of 27 AD and the spring of 27 AD, we had John the Baptist beheaded, 5,000 fed, Jesus walks on the water. The Pharisees from Jerusalem come and, you know, and they're, they're arguing with Jesus. Then we have the 4,000 fed. We have the Bethsaida blind man healed. And then we have the confession of Peter. We have the death of the... Uh, of the uh, death is first foretold when he said he would die and raise again. We have the transfiguration Demonic boy is healed, which we just talked about, and said, and then we're going to look at the second prediction of his death and resurrection. This happened in the summer of 27 AD. Where were they during this time? Mm -hmm. oh, there we go. Um, they were right in there. Here's Mount Tabor. So they had come down from Mount Tabor. And they were in one of these cities. It could have been Nazareth. It doesn't tell us exactly. But it sounds like he was over on this side someplace because Nazareth is his hometown where he couldn't do anything. It was so full of unbelief. And it sounds reasonable that he may perhaps was in this area in this story that we just got done talking about. So this is where they were. Now, I wanted to, to take Malachi for a minute because <clears throat> Jesus in his discourse on Elijah, I was looking at this today, and honestly, first time I'd seen it. So this is brand new stuff. I've never seen it anywhere. I just, this is my opinion. This is some Alanese, okay, I'll tell you right off the bat. I don't have anything back this up. But I want you to notice something here, and it just struck me that the fourth chapter of Malachi, to me, outlines the history of Israel from Malachi forward. Notice what it says. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who are wickedly will stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, we kind of historically have looked at that first verse and said that's talking about the end days, you know, when, um, you know, all this. I don't think so because it says they will leave them neither root nor branch. And that's just the opposite of what's going to happen in the last days. This, however, happened right after Jesus left. Or right, it started actually during that time. Because... Well, Israel had already been wiped out. They were no longer there. Judah was still a nation, but they were just about to get wiped out. In 70 AD, Rome wiped them out, and that was the end of the Israeli nation until 1948. So when I'm reading it with that in mind, now I'm seeing a day coming like an oven when their root's going to be cut off, when their branch is going to be cut off. They're not, and this is a nation. This is what he's talking about. What's the next thing that happens? Well, in verse 2, But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. Now we look at that and say, wait a minute, no, no Israel never happened. Yeah, it did. 
if we compress what's happened, we see this very thing happening after the suffering Messiah. Because he came, he came first to the Jews. See, he was the first one to bring this idea of the son of righteousness with healing in his wings, and you shall grow fat like stall-fed calves. What is a stall-fed calf? Well, you, you know, it's how you fatten them up. You feed them full of grain, and it gets on the inside, and they get all fat. Maybe I'm stretching it. I don't know. You can judge for yourself. But he certainly brought salvation to the individual, to the calf, if you will, that suddenly could be fattened up spiritually. Because in the Old Testament, the prophets always said of Israel that they weren't spat. I mean, they were scrawny. They were you know, hard-hearted and you know, all the things that they described them. And then we had restoration. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under your soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb and all of Israel, with the statutes and judgments. Hmm, okay. Isn't that the time kind of that we're in now? They've been gathered. They're going to trample the wicked. Haven't, hasn't Israel trampled the wicked every time they've come against them since 1948? Mm -hmm. They should not have won the war in 1948. They shouldn't have won, won the war in 1967. They shouldn't have won. Every one of these, when these hordes of Arabs and, and, and they all come against them, what happens? They just wipe them out. Send them back and take their country. It's happened over and over and over again. It doesn't sound like this. It sounds like this. And then finally, the coming Messiah, conquering Messiah. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the father and children and the hearts of the children of their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Last day. If Elijah didn't come and turn the hearts of the children to their fathers, or the hearts of the fathers to their children, hearts of the children to their fathers, if he didn't turn them back, and what is he talking about here? He's talking about bringing them back into that position before God of family. And we see that's what happens in the book of Revelation. These two witnesses come down, and for three and a half years, they wreak havoc on the earth. It's very similar to what Moses did in, in Egypt. I mean, there's plagues coming down, all kinds of stuff happening, but Israel under that is being brought together again as a family. They're already a nation, but as a family. You see, right now, Israel is a nation, but it's not a family. Uh, you know, when you go over there, you've got the Orthodox Jew, and you've got the modern Jew, and you've got those that are atheists, and you got got, yeah, I mean, and they all have their own little things, you know, and, and politics is based on whether you're Orthodox or whether you're a, a new covenant and, and all of this stuff, and, and it's been that way. As there isn't a unification, but he's going to bring that out. And I thought that was interesting when I looked at that. It just kind of hit me, and I said, well, <clears throat> I think I'll present it tonight. And you can throw that out or keep it or think about it or whatever. But I think it's a way of looking at the history of Israel up to this point from the uh, dispersion of uh, and seeing how God summed it up in four simple verses. Amazing, the Word of God to me. It's just amazing. All right, let's look at the last uh, point we have tonight. Um, here he was still in at Caesarea Philippi in that area. Um, oops, that's not the one I want. Where am I here? Put the wrong page. Here we go. It's the second prediction of his death and resurrection. Matthew 17, verses 22 to 23. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And they will kill him. And the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly 
sorrowful. Mark 9, verses 30, and 30 to 32, Then they departed from there, from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and after he was killed, he is killed, he will raise the third day. But they did not understand this saying and were afraid to ask him. In Luke 9, verses 43 to 45, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink down into your ears. For the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them, so that they did not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. So here we have Jesus. He'd been healing. Uh, you know, he just cast out this demonic uh, demon out of this boy. Uh, and it says they were now staying in Galilee. Nazareth, probably, that was where his house was. That's probably where he was. Uh, and they departed from there. <clears throat> and we were going through Galilee. Now, Jesus took off originally to make this a secret. <laughs> he, he, he didn't want anyone to know it, that he was going through Galilee. Because he didn't want the multitudes there. He didn't want to be teaching multitudes when he's trying to tell his disciples something. That was important. You notice he said, don't tell anybody about the transfiguration. And now he's saying, I want to keep this just between us. That's kind of what he's saying. Here. Why was it? If they had let everyone know about the transfiguration, and if they had let everyone know that he's going to die and rise again, raise again in three days, would they have crucified him? When you look at the transfiguration and the power and glory that was there, and you tie that to all of his miracles, would the people have killed him? No, the multitudes probably would have went to Jerusalem and, and you know, they'd have had the high priest strung up. I mean, you know, really. And so he could not allow the multitudes to see his glory. Only three, and those his closest ones. He couldn't even trust the other nine. And now he's out here and he's telling them that I'm going to die. This is the second time he's telling them that, that I'm going to be taken by men and killed, but in the third, on the third day I'm going to rise. Notice Matthew's account says that they were greatly sorrowful. They caught the killing, they didn't catch the rising. Perhaps they thought that when Jesus was killed, that three days later would be the great res great resurrection. See, they didn't they didn't get the you know they didn't have anything about the second coming of Jesus and the resurrection or the of the church. And they, that was so. The only thing they were looking for was the resurrection of the dead. And so perhaps what they were saying or thinking, Jesus is going to die and three days later we're going to have the resurrection of the dead and this whole thing's over. And they were sorrowful. And then we have Mark and Luke and they both let's say, put down here, they didn't understand what he was talking about. But both of them said they were afraid to ask him. You know, there's something about the majesty and glory of God when you see it. It's hard to approach it. I don't know, maybe, maybe they treated Jesus a little different after the transfiguration. Maybe Peter, James, and John were not so anxious to get close to him like they were before. Now, hey, I mean, you know, I mean, he could touch us and we'd disappear. We'd just be cinders with that kind of power. Remember, they saw him white like snow and, and, and his face just glowing and, and, you know, whoa, I don't want him touching me with that stuff. 
So there was a, probably a fear. And then, you know, of course, Luke's um, account starts off by saying, and they were all amazed at the majesty of God. Wow. And so they probably were very fearful to ask Jesus much of anything. Also, remember he told them, I speak in parables so people don't understand. Maybe they thought he was giving them a parable and they weren't supposed to understand it. I don't know. I don't know. But one thing we do know, that at this juncture they were convinced, at least three of them, that he was the Son of God. All right, any questions? No? Mm -hmm.